How's it going, world? Hope you're well, hope you're safe, hope you've had a good day. I had a pretty wicked day, to be fair. Like, listen, listen, like, <clears throat> I've got things are happening, okay? And I'm getting excited, but I need to calm myself down and I need to walk before I can run. But things are happening and they're happening well, so that's what's getting me excited. And I'm going to update you guys on that very, very shortly. However, for now, welcome back to the Rules of Thinking with Richard Templar. Yesterday, we went over rule number 17. Cut yourself some slack. So, that's what I'm doing today. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. So, when it came to training today, I was actually planning on training tonight after all my meetings and such, right? But... um it's now nearly half past nine and I'm literally only just getting around to this now and I've got another phone call after this so I'm not going to be training today. However, I'm going to make up for it by training the next two days in a row, okay? And I'm not going to beat myself up about it or feel bad about it. Like, sometimes time just ain't, you know, like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so let's go on to healthy thinking. That's the next chapter in Richard's book. So, our thoughts and our feelings are intrinsically linked. If you want to feel good, happy, relaxed, capable, you have to adopt the right patterns of thought to achieve it. This is the basis on which most mental health treatment is based. Yes, there can be medication and other means of support, but most of the help out there is about learning to think in ways that will lead you to feel better. Some people's lives make this a particularly tough process. But all of us will feel better if we think in helpful ways. A lot of this is about habits of thinking and learning the thought patterns that will ensure that day-to-day -day life is good. The last section focused on the ways of thinking that are essential in building resilience, so that when an emotional trauma comes along and derails us, we can recover faster. This section is about looking after yourself mentally between those big life events. Although, of course, following these rules will lead to a healthy attitude that can only help at those times. But you want to feel as good as you can all the time. And the people you know who always seem chilled and easygoing and happy are people who follow these rules. Sure, some of us are naturally healthy to begin with and others have to work a bit harder. But these rules make strong mental health and a positive outlook an option for all of us. I'm looking forward to this, actually, Richard. I'm all about mental health. Definitely, I'm all about mental health. Let's see what you've got to say. So, rule number 18. Think yourself happy. We all know people whose default setting is cheerful. <laughs> you've been watching these videos, Richard. It's not that their lives are any better on paper than anyone else's. It's all about their attitude. 100%. You can always choose your attitude. Indeed, if you go to some of the poorest or most war-ravaged places in the world, you'll still be able to find people who are positive despite everything. If they can do it, why can't we? 100%. You've got to keep perspective. The answer to this is that being positive is not about our circumstances. It's about the way we think. True. Of course, the most positive people have moments when they don't feel very cheerful. That is true as well. <laughs> the opposite applies. <laughs> but they still cope better than they would without their positive attitude. I've seen several elderly people lose their husbands or wives after decades of marriage, which is always horribly sad to see, and almost as traumatic for them as anything they could imagine. You would understand if they fell into a deep depression from which they never emerged. Indeed, some of them quite understandably do this. It's edifying to see how the rest of them avoid spending the rest of their lives in misery. And the answer lies in the way they choose to think. They have their miserable, weepy moments. Of course they do. Lots of them in the early days. But then they tell themselves how lucky they are. They remind themselves how long they had with their partner. The wonderful children they produced together. The great times they had. And it's that mindset that enables them to face life alone. A hundred percent. The attitude of gratitude, like, it, it's hard to feel sad or down when you're, when you're feeling grateful. I always advocate 
the attitude of gratitude. Just just try it tomorrow, yeah? Just throughout the day, set 10 alarms on the hour every hour and just think of something to be grateful for when those alarms go off. Just watch how your day goes. Honestly, it will be different. What you think affects how you feel. It might not seem like it at first, but these positive thoughts are a kind of affirmation and over time, your feelings will adapt to them. Keep looking for the positive. Always see the glass as half full. Find the silver lining and focus on that. No one is pretending the glass doesn't have an empty half. We know it's there, but you don't have to dwell on it. That means no self-pity. Yep, self-pity is all about the empty half of the glass. And if you keep thinking about that, of course you'll feel bad. I know it's tempting to dwell on the negative, whether you've lost your lifetime partner or just feel a bit under the weather. But as soon as you give in to it, you've allowed the the half-empty glass to dominate and you'll have to work even harder to refocus on the positive. People who don't do self-pity are happier than people who do. It's as simple as that. Which camp do you want to be in? I never actually, like, give in to self-pity. Me and a good friend of mine, we often have this debate that I'm not a very sympathetic person. I'm, I can be very empathetic. I can empathise with people. I can be compassionate and uh, I can have a wide enough perspective to have an understanding and, and empathise. But I associate sympathy with pity. And you don't want my pity. As optimistic and hopeful as I am, if I pity you, that means I ain't got no hope for you. You don't want my pity in it. That, that's how I look at sympathy as pity. You know, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Let me know your thoughts. I'm not suggesting you should never allow yourself to be upset about anything. Wouldn't that be lovely? But it's unrealistic. The idea is not to go into denial about what you're going through and refuse to acknowledge your negative feelings. That wouldn't be healthy. You need to acknowledge them. Give yourself permission to feel upset or angry or miserable and then consider the reasons to be positive. It's frustrating to be short of money, but at least I have enough for the rent. Not easy when life is tough, but this is about what works, not what's fair or easy. The moral of the story, people who don't do self-pity are happier than people who do. I'd have to say I agree with that one, Richard. I've not actually read anything today that I can disagree with, like fair play. I like that one. Let me know your thoughts. Cheers.